Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, Judge Jackson. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, Senator. I, I'd like to take a few minutes, if I could, and just uh, give you a chance to address some of the issues just raised. My colleague suggested that you've never sentenced a defendant in a child pornography case consistent with what the government requested, what the prosecution requested. But according to my staff's research, that's just not true. So let me briefly ask you about three specific sentencing cases. Do you remember US v. Nickerson? You sentenced Charles Nickerson Jr. to 10 years in prison, exactly what the government requested. I do, Senator. Do you remember US v. Fife? You sentenced him to 20 years in prison, exactly what the government requested. I do, Senator. And do you recall U.S. v. Nguyen? Um, you sentenced him to 37 months in prison, exactly what the prosecution requested. I do, Senator. So in, in these three cases, it's also true that the government, the prosecution, requested below guidelines sentences. Would that seem surprising to you at all? It would not. And is that because overwhelmingly nationwide in 70% of cases and in your district, 80% of cases, downward departures from the guidelines are the norm? That is correct, Senator. So to the extent there seems to be some concerted effort to try and uh, characterize you as being uh, soft on crime or uh, somehow uh, unconcerned about child safety, uh, I just wanted to take another moment um, and give you a chance uh, to respond to that. Um, as a parent, uh, as the member of a family that's had um, several members uh, who've served your brother, your uncles in law enforcement, um, could you share a bit about how having loved ones who serve as law enforcement officers, in one case a detective on a sex crimes unit, um, has had an impact on your sense of the balance of uh, justice and mercy in the case of um, ensuring that we hold to account those who commit crimes against children. Thank you, Senator. As a mother, these cases involving sex crime, crimes against children are harrowing. What I think is important to understand is that trial judges who have to deal with these cases are presented with the evidence or descriptions, graphic descriptions. These are the cases that wake you up at night because you're seeing the worst of humanity. When, when there are victim statements that are presented, when people talk about how their lives have been destroyed as children, how the people who they trusted to take care of them were abusing them in this way, and then putting the pictures on the internet for everyone to see. I sometimes still have nightmares about the main witness, the, the woman I mentioned earlier who cannot leave her house because of this kind of fear, the vulnerability, the isolation. These cr crimes are, are horrible. And so I take them very seriously, just as I did all of the crimes, but especially crimes against children. So, Your Honor, if I could, um, the, the characterization that was just presented. Uh, in a recent column in the National Review, a, a conservative publication, um, has uh, characterized that view of you as a smear that appears meritless to the point of demagoguery and characterizes your approach in sentencing in these cases as mainstream and correct. And I'll just remind my colleagues and those watching that um, two of the largest, uh, most substantial law enforcement advocacy organizations in our country, the National Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, have spoken up uh, in support of your qualifications and um, your capabilities. Uh, the FOP letter says there's little doubt you have the temperament, intellect, legal experience, and family background to have earned this appointment. That sentiment was echoed by the IACP 
In their letter, they said, um, you believe you have a deep understanding of and appreciation for the challenges and complexities confronting the policing profession, and you have, during your time as a judge, displayed your dedication to ensuring our communities are safe and that the interests of justice are served. I find it hard to believe that these organizations, having looked closely at your judicial decisional record, your sentencing decisions, um, your lifetime conduct, would have taken those unusual steps to be that forceful uh, in supporting you if, in fact, you had somehow a disturbing record of uh, coddling child pornographers or being soft on crime. In fact, Judge, your record, in my view, demonstrates you're an even-handed and impartial judge. And I can see that when I look at cases you've ruled on uh, that involve very um, politically charged or partisan interests. Uh, you've delivered rulings on both sides for plaintiffs and defendants, uh, and in my review of your record, you've put any personal views or concerns aside. You've based your decisions on the argument of the parties, the facts in the record, the applicable law and precedent, and the well-reasoned and thorough opinions you've written show to me a judge striving to make even-handed decisions based on facts and law, not on some caricature of a leftist agenda. Um, but don't just take my word for it. Um, we've received an outpouring of support for your nomination. Uh, as we'll hear on Thursday, a very wide range of groups and individuals have um, sent letters or testimony to this committee in support of your nomination. It's no surprise to me that your, your legal mind, your experience, your temperament inspire strong support from some of the best and brightest of our legal community. Um, and I think it's worth highlighting that among those many who have written to us uh, are included well-respected conservative and Republican lawyers and Republican-appointed judges who agree with my characterization that you're an even-handed and impartial judge. We've received a letter from 24 conservative lawyers who held positions in Republican administrations or are well-known for their conservative political or legal views who wrote this committee to urge your speedy confirmation. They praised your character and intellect and called you, and I quote, a truly excellent person. I'd like to focus, though, on the way that these conservative lawyers characterized your judicial decision-making, which is, after all, the core issue before us, is whether you are the sort of judge at the district court, circuit court, that should be elevated to the Supreme Court. And they note in this letter that in nearly 10 years on the bench, as a district judge and then in the Court of Appeals, Judge Jackson has been involved in thousands of cases running the full range of federal law. You're approximately 500, I think it's more than 570 now. Opinions written during this time have, and I'm quoting, demonstrated complete command of the legal subject matter, a judicious and even-handed approach, a fine ability to express yourself with force and great clarity. They've also demonstrated, and I'm quoting, another attribute essential for a judge, a sense of empathy for the situations of others. Judicious and even-handed. These prominent conservative lawyers want this committee to know you're judicious and even-handed and recommend you for the Supreme Court without reservation, despite having noted they differ with you concerning some political or partisan issues. And they're not alone. Uh, judge Griffith, in a letter to this committee, and then followed up with personal testimony in your introduction yesterday, uh, a judge appointed by former President George W. Bush enthusiastically supports your nomination. I was struck by his description of your intellectual capacity, your keen legal mind, as well as your character and judicial approach. And now I'm quoting from his testimony to this committee yesterday. Judge Jackson, he told us, is an independent jurist who adjudicates based on the facts and the law, not as a partisan. He went on, as Justice Scalia taught us, an indispensable feature of the republic the Constitution created is an independent judiciary of judges who've taken an oath not to a president or a party, but to the American people and to God that they will be impartial. And he concluded that you, Judge Jackson, have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to that oath. That's a conservative judge appointed by a Republican president who told this committee he's confident you'll decide cases based on the facts and the law, not as a partisan. 
Now, I value the working relationships I have with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. We can and do at times have fierce policy disagreements, but we also work together to try and find ways as lawmakers and individuals to respect each other. And I take it as a personal sort of badge or a source of pride when someone with whom I really disagree on one issue is able to legislate with me on another. And so I imagine, Your Honor, it must be gratifying to know that a judge who literally sat in judgment of, reviewed dozens and dozens of your opinions. In fact, I think he reversed you once. Oh, more than. <laughs> more so than. Here is someone who closely read and reviewed your decisions and as a circuit judge sat in review of your work over years as a district, hundreds of opinions as a district court judge, and has such unequivocal praise for the even-handed, impartial, thorough, and nonpartisan way you've approached judicial decision-making. Could you just briefly share with me what it means to you to hear that someone like Judge Griffith has such confidence you would make an excellent member of our highest court? Thank you, Senator. It means the world to me to have the support of Judge Griffith. His coming here yesterday and testifying on my behalf was so gratifying. Um, I have tried in every respect to follow my methodology that enables me to rule impartially in every case and to understand the limits of my own judicial authority and thereby reach decisions without fear or favor. My record demonstrates that I am not proceeding from any sort of preconceived notion about how a case comes out. I'm not ruling consistent with any sort of ideology. I'm doing what impartial and fair judges do, which is to decide in every case based only on the facts and the law of that case. And I'm very, very pleased that Judge Griffith um, has seen that in the years that he supervised me effectively as a court of appeals judge when I was a district judge. And I think it, it's wonderful that he was able to come here and testify to that. Well, Judge, uh, for those watching and um, for those following this, that they might be puzzled um, because my colleague, uh, the junior senator from the state of Texas, has tried to ascribe all sorts of views to you in his recent questioning that try to paint you as some kind of, a, of an activist with a radical agenda. And in my review of your experience and your record, these letters from judges and scholars, I, I don't see anything that remotely substantiates uh, that claim. We are here to evaluate your qualifications, your judicial decision making. But So let me get at a few of these points specifically, if I could. I've heard references to the 1619 Project and critical race theory, um, but I didn't hear that cited in any reference to your opinions as a judge. In your nine years on the bench as a district court judge, more than 570 decisions, have you ever cited the 1619 Project? No, Senator. In your nine years on the bench and more than 570 opinions, have you ever cited the journalist or principal author of that 1619 Project, Ms. Hannah Jones? I have not. And in your nine years on the bench and more than 570 decisions, have you ever used, employed, relied upon critical race theory to determine the outcome of any case or to impose any sentence or as a, as a framework for your decision making? No, Senator. Um, would you just explain to us briefly what sort of factors you do, in fact, consider in your analysis? Senator, when I analyze a case, I am looking at the arguments that the parties raise in the case. I'm looking at the record, which is the facts of the case developed, if I'm on the Court of Appeals, developed below. And I'm looking at the law. I'm looking at any statutes. I'm hewing to the text. I'm looking at constitutional provisions to the extent that they are applicable and any precedents related to the case at issue. Those are the inputs that are appropriate for a judge to consider 
And those are the only things that I use in my decision making. Well, I, I appreciate your laying that out. And I, I'll, I'll just let me dig into two cases, if I can, that I think are also probative here, because uh, I, I agree with the wide range of supporters we've heard from that you've demonstrated an even and impartial judicial approach in your record. Um, but this is true not just in the hundreds of sort of run of the mill um, quotidian cases that are considered by a district court judge, but in several that have been highly charged and really quite political in terms of their consequences. Um, I'd like to discuss your opinion in the Center for Biological Diversity versus Mekalinen. Do you recall that case? I do, Senator. It was a dispute between groups advocating for environmental protection and the Trump administration's Department of Homeland Security. Um, the dispute was about President Trump's efforts to quickly construct a physical border wall between the United States and Mexico. I'm sure I don't need to remind you or anyone here that at the time, um, uh, Democrats were just about unanimous in thinking that physically building a wall from coast to coast was not the wisest use of resources to secure the border. There were other ways to do it, and with Republicans pretty much unanimously willing to defend it. So it was a policy matter with some sharp divisions and some political consequences. You ultimately ruled in favor of the construction of the wall and against an attempt by environmental groups to halt its construction through um, legal case, through a legal case. Can you discuss what you recall just briefly of the claims presented and how you came to a decision in favor of the Trump administration? Senator, the claims in that case, uh, which as you say were brought by an environmental organization, um, related to the Administrative Procedures Act, which is something that um, we often um, see in the District of Columbia, and whether or not the agency uh, could waive certain environmental laws pertaining to the construction of the wall, whether or not the agency's determination to do so uh, was lawful. And I looked at the relevant um, circumstances, and I ended up, I believe, dismissing that case um, on, on threshold grounds uh, before getting to that point in the analysis. But um, consistent with what you said, I was guided um, by my understanding of the law and what it required, and not by anything else. I could spend a lot of time on the details of this case, um, but let me try and summarize it this way. Um, you analyzed the statute. You concluded Congress had clearly blocked the courts from hearing non-constitutional challenges. There was no jurisdictional bar to the constitutional claims. To decide them, you considered whether the plaintiff's claims were viable. You looked for precedent. You found one. While not controlling, you thought it was legally sound um, and persuasive. Um, but there was no controlling circuit court or Supreme Court precedent that stopped you. If you were, in fact, an activist judge, a motivated partisan determined to let these plaintiff environmental groups proceed, you certainly could have. There was no clear precedent that barred that from happening. You analyzed the statute you applied the best precedent you could find, and you reached a result without regard to the political consequence. That is correct, Senator. So in my view, um, I wanted to talk about this case because it, 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 there's really nothing unusual or special about it from your perspective. That is correct. For those of us up here, there was a lot special and important about it. It was a highly charged partisan and political issue, but you looked at the statute, you found persuasive precedent, you applied it, you went on to the next case. Well, let me ask about another decision. Um, in a case addressing another very politically charged issue, and specifically this involves the emails of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now the Republican National Committee, or the RNC, is opposing your nomination, publicly accusing you of being a partisan, of a partisan Democrat. And they argue you could not possibly be an impartial justice. But ironically, back in 2016, you presided over a case brought by the RNC against USAID related to then presidential candidate Clinton, and you ruled in favor of the RNC. Both the substance and the timing of the case are, are really quite striking. I did. The RNC made Freedom of Information Act requests for certain emails involving the former secretary. And despite 
what the RNC would have us now believe. Um, I, in this case, you reinforced your deserved reputation for following the law, not a partisan agenda, because you ordered USAID to produce thousands of pages of documents related to Secretary Clinton. Do you recall when you issued that decision, that order? I actually don't. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was just before the presidential conventions. So if there was a moment when the RNC had a political objective, it was right before the convention, and you actually issued a ruling that they were entitled to email production from the USAID on the basis of legal arguments presented to you, the statute at issue, and the evidence. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, Your Honor, I, I'm, you know, I'm frankly really struck um, at the fact that, you know, for all the back and forth uh, in Senate hearings and uh, academic circles about the judicial philosophy of Supreme Court nominees, um, you've shown what the experience of nearly a decade overwhelmingly spent on the district court has produced, a methodology, an approach that looks at the Constitution, the statute, the facts, the arguments of the parties, and reaches a result. Um, without fear or favor, without taking into account the partisan issue at stake. Um, you know, I don't believe that a, a judicial philosophy is always all that meaningful. Um, the judge for whom I clerked on the Third Circuit had spent years as a district court judge, and when I asked her, you know, what's your judicial philosophy, she looked at me and said, I just call balls and strikes. I'm a judge who rolls on the case before me in exactly the same frame that you offered. A judicial philosophy does not in and of itself constrain a judge. What constrains a judge is a judge who is willing to be constrained, who understands that the role of the federal judiciary is a limited one. And so the real question I think a president should consider when they make a nomination, the question that we as senators need the answer to in order to perform our function of advice and consent and the question that I think resonates best with the American people who are concerned about this hearing and this nomination and how it will impact the country and their lives is sort of what kind of justice will you be? We want to know if you'll be fair. We want to know if you'll be faithful to the Constitution and to the rule of law. You've been a judge almost 10 years and you've written more than 570 opinions. I'd say your record as a judge is the best answer to the question what kind of justice you will be. How would you say, Your Honor, that your approach to judging on the district court relates to the way you are now judging on the circuit court, and what approach do you think you will bring with you if confirmed to the Supreme Court? Thank you, Senator. My approach all the way through is one that I believe is required by my duties by my oath as a judge. We rule without fear or favor. We are independent as judges in our responsibilities. We understand at the district court level, at the court of appeals level, and at the Supreme Court that judges are restrained, are constrained in the exercise of our power under our constitutional scheme. My methodology is designed to help me to make decisions within those confines at every level. It's no different now that I'm on the Court of Appeals than when I was on the district court with respect to my understanding of the constraints on my authority and my responsibility to be impartial in my rulings. And I think it would be no different at the Supreme Court. Well, Your Honor, I, I know we've walked through just a few cases um, today now. In some ways, we've only scratched the surface of your decade and the more than 570 opinions you've written. Um, but it's clear to me from what I've reviewed and from just this sample that, as we also heard from um, colleagues, from conservative lawyers, from judges who wrote to the committee, that you are judicious and even-handed, that you have a demonstrated record of excellence, that you adjudicate based on the facts and the law and not as an advocate, activist, or partisan. Um, and I encourage my colleagues who want to know what kind of a justice you'll be to take a fair and even-handed look 
at your record, at your impartiality, and at your methodology. Your experience is extensive and broad. Your commitment to follow the law impartially and without the influence of politics is evident in your record. Your keen legal mind, judicial temperament, and impeccable character are plain to all. As Judge Griffith told this committee in a review of your record makes clear, you've demonstrated that the way you approach cases is based on the law and not on some political agenda. You understand the reason why the robes of our federal judges are black, not red or blue. The American justice system, as many have said, is rooted in the impartiality, the independence, and the reliability of our federal judicial system. It is one of the most critical bulwarks of our system of ordered liberty. No wonder that when you came before this body to be confirmed for the district court and then the circuit court, you earned and received bipartisan support. I know President Biden counts nominating a Supreme Court justice among the most significant decisions of his presidency, and our role here in the Senate in confirming a justice to our highest court is among our most solemn obligations and greatest privileges. So in nominating you, I believe our president has met his mission, and it will be my honor to join, I hope, the overwhelming majority of my colleagues in supporting your confirmation as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.